Section zero of Three Hundred Aesop's Fables, translated by George Filer Townsend. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Armenta. Three Hundred Aesop's Fables by Aesop, translated by George Filer Townsend, 1867. Section Zero Preface The tale, the parable, and the fable are all common and popular modes of conveying instruction. Each is distinguished by its own special characteristics. The tale consists simply in the narration of a story either founded on facts or created solely by the imagination, and not necessarily associated with the teaching of any moral lesson. The parable is the designed use of language purposely intended to convey a hidden and secret meaning other than that contained in the words themselves and which may or may not bear a special reference to the hearer or reader. It will contain, like the tale, a short but real narrative. It will seek, like the parable, to convey a hidden meaning, and that not so much by the use of language as by the skillful introduction of fictitious characters, and yet unlike to either tale or parable, it will ever keep in view, as its high prerogative and inseparable attitude, the great purpose of instruction, and will necessarily seek to inculcate some moral maxim, social duty, or political truth. The true fable, if it rise to its high requirements, ever aims at one great end and purpose representation of human motive, and the improvement of human conduct, and yet it so conceals its design under the disguise of fictitious characters, by clothing with speech the animals of the field, the birds of the air, the trees of the wood, or the beasts of the forest, that the reader shall receive advice without perceiving the presence of the adviser. Thus, the superiority of the counselor which often renders counsel unpalatable, is kept out of view, and the lesson comes with the greater acceptance when the reader is led, unconsciously to itself, to have his sympathies enlisted in belief of what is pure, honorable, and praiseworthy, and to have his indignation excited against what is low, ignoble, and unworthy. The true fabulist, therefore, discharges a most important function. He is neither a narrator nor an allegorist. He is a great teacher, a corrector of morals, a censor of vice, and a commander of virtue. In this consists the superiority of the fable over the tale or the parable. The fabulist is to create a laugh, but yet, under a merry guise, to convey instruction. Phaedrus, the great imitator of Aesop, plainly indicates this double purpose to be the true office of the writer of fables. The continual observance of this twofold aim creates the charms and accounts for the universal favor of the fables of Aesop. The fable, says Professor K. O. Mueller, originated in Greece in an intentional travesty of human affairs. The Aenos, as its name denotes, is an admonition, or rather a reproof, veiled, either from fear of an excess of frankness, or from a love of fun and jest, beneath the fiction of an occurrence happening among beasts. And wherever we have any ancient and authentic account of the Aesopian fables, we find it to be the same. The construction of a fable involves a minute attention to 1. The narration itself 2. 
the deduction of the moral, and three, a careful maintenance of the individual characteristics of the fictitious personages introduced into it. The narration should relate to one simple action consistent with itself, and neither be overladen with a multiplicity of details, nor distracted by a variety of circumstances. The moral, or lesson, should be so plain and so intimately interwoven with, and so necessarily dependent on, the narration, that every reader should be compelled to give to it the same undeniable interpretation. The introduction of the animals, or fictitious characters, should be marked with an unexceptionable care and attention to their natural attributes. The fox should be always cunning, the hare timid, the lion bold, the wolf cruel, the bull strong, the horse proud, and the ass patient. Many of these fables are characterized by the strictest observance of these rules. They are occupied with one short narrative from which the moral naturally flows, and with which it is intimately associated. Quote, "'Tis the simple manner," says Dosley, "'in which the morals of Aesop are interwoven with his fables that distinguishes him, and gives him the preference over all other mythologists. His mountain delivered of a mouse produces the moral of his fable in ridicule of pompous pretenders, and his crow, when she drops her cheese, lets fall, as it were by accident, the strongest admonition against the power of flattery. There is no need of a separate sentence to explain it, no possibility of impressing it deeper by that load we too often see of accumulated reflections." End quote. An equal amount of praise is due for the consistency with which the characters of the animals, fictitiously introduced, are marked. While we are made to depict the motives and passions of men, they retain, in an eminent degree, their own special features of craft or counsel, of cowardice or courage, of generosity or rapacity. These terms of praise, it must be confessed, cannot be bestowed on all the fables in this collection. Many of them lack that unity of design, that close connection of moral with the narrative, that wise choice in the introduction of the animals, which constitute the charm and excellency of true Aesopian fable. This inferiority of some to others is sufficiently accounted for in the history of the origin and descent of these fables. The great bulk of them are not the immediate work of Aesop. Many are obtained from ancient authors prior to the time in which he lived. Thus, the fable of the hawk and the nightingale is related by Hesiod. The eagle wounded by an arrow winged with its own feathers, by Aeschylus, and the fox avenging his wrongs on the eagle, by Archilochus. Many of them are of later origin, and are to be traced to the monks of the Middle Ages, and yet this collection, though thus made up of fables both earlier and later than the era of Aesop, rightfully bears his name, because he composed so large a number all framed in the same mold and conformed to the same fashion and stamped with the same lineaments, image, and superscription, as to secure to himself the right to be considered the father of Greek fables and the founder of this class of writing, which has ever since borne his name, and has secured for him, through all succeeding ages, the position of the first of moralists. The fables were in the first instance only narrated by Aesop, and for a long time were handed down by the uncertain channel of oral tradition. Socrates is mentioned by Plato as having employed his time while in prison, awaiting the return of the sacred ship from Delphos, which was to be the signal of his death, 
in turning some of these fables into verse, but he thus versified only such as he remembered. Demetrius Valerius, a philosopher at Athens around 300 B.C., is said to have made the first collection of these fables. Phaedrus, a slave by birth or by subsequent misfortunes, and admitted by Augustus to the honors of a freed man, imitated many of these fables in Latin iambics about the commencement of the Christian era. Aphthonius, the rhetorician of Antioch, A.D. 315, wrote a treatise on and converted into Latin prose some of these fables. This translation is the more worthy of notice, as it illustrates a custom of common use, both in these and in later times. The rhetoricians and philosophers were accustomed to give the fables of Aesop as an exercise to their scholars, not only inviting them to discuss the moral of the tale, but also to practice and to perfect themselves thereby in style and rules of grammar, by making for themselves new and various versions of the fables. Ausonius, the friend of the Emperor Valentinian, and the latest poet of eminence in the Western Empire, has handed down some of these fables in verse, which Julianus Titanius, a contemporary writer of no great fame, translated into prose. Avenius, also a contemporary of Ausonius, put some of these fables into Latin elegiacs, which are given by Nevelle, in a book we shall refer to hereafter, and are occasionally incorporated with the editions of Phaedrus. Seven centuries elapsed before the next notice is found of the fables of Aesop. During this long period, these fables seem to have suffered an eclipse, to have disappeared, and to have been forgotten. And it is at the commencement of the fourteenth century, when the Byzantine emperors were the great patrons of learning, and amidst the splendors of an Asiatic court, that we next find honors paid to the name and memory of Aesop. Maximus Planudes a learned monk of Constantinople, made a collection of about a hundred and fifty of these fables. Little is known of his history. Planudes, however, was no mere recluse shut up in his monastery. He took an active part in public affairs. In 1327 A.D., he was sent on a diplomatic mission to Venice by the emperor Andronicus the Elder. This brought him into immediate contact with the Western Patriarch, whose interests he henceforth advocated with so much zeal as to bring on him suspicion and persecution from the rulers of the Eastern Church. Planides has been exposed to a twofold accusation. He is charged, on the one hand, with having had before him a copy of Babrius, to whom we shall have occasion to refer at greater length in the end of this preface, and to have had the bad taste to transpose, or to turn his poetical version into prose, and he is asserted, on the other hand, never to have seen the fables of Aesop at all, but to have himself invented and made the fables which he palmed off under the name of the famous Greek fabulist. The truth lies between these two extremes. Planudes may have invented some new fables, or have inserted some that were current in his day, but there is an abundance of unanswerable internal evidence to prove that he had an acquaintance with the veritable fables of Aesop although the versions he had access to were probably corrupt, as contained in the various translations and dispositional exercises of the rhetoricians and philosophers. His collection is interesting and important, not only as the parent source of foundation of the earlier printed versions of Aesop, but as the direct channel 
of attracting to these fables the attention of the learned. The eventual reintroduction, however, of these fables of Aesop to their high place in the general literature of Christendom is to be looked for in the West rather than the East. The calamities gradually thickening round the Eastern Empire and the fall of Constantinople, 1453 A.D., combine with other events to promote a rapid restoration of learning in Italy, and with that recovery of learning, the revival of an interest in the fables of Aesop is closely identified. These fables, indeed, were among the first writings of an earlier antiquity that attracted attention. They took their place beside the Holy Scriptures and the ancient classic authors in the minds of the great students of that day. Lorenzo Valla, one of the most famous promoters of Italian learning, not only translated into Latin the Iliad of Homer and the histories of Herodotus and Thucydides, but also the fables of Aesop. These fables, again, were among the books brought into an extended circulation by the agency of the printing press. Banus Accursius, as early as 1475 to 1480, printed the collection of these fables made by Planudes, which within five years afterwards Caxton translated into English and printed them at his press in Westminster Abbey, 1485. It must be mentioned also that the learning of this age has left permanent traces of its influence on these fables by causing the interpolation with them of some of those amusing stories which were so frequently introduced into the public discourses of the great preachers of those days, of which specimens are yet to be found in the extant sermons of Jean Rowlin Meffreth and Gabriel Barlett. The publication of this era, which most probably has influenced these fables, as the Liber Facitarium, a book consisting of a hundred jests and stories by the celebrated Pagio Bracolini, published A.D. 1471, from which the two fables of the miller, his son, and the ass, and the fox and the woodcutter, are undoubtedly selected. The knowledge of these fables rapidly spread from Italy into Germany, and their popularity was increased by the favor and sanction given to them by the great fathers of the Reformation, who frequently used them as vehicles for satire and protest against the tricks and abuses of the Romish ecclesiastics. The zealous and renowned Camerarius, who took an active part in the preparation of the Confession of Augsburg, found time, amidst his numerous avocations, to prepare a version for the students in the University of Tübingen. Martin Luther translated twenty of these fables, and was urged by Melanchthon to complete the whole, while Gottfried Arnold, the celebrated Lutheran theologian and librarian to Frederick I, King of Prussia, mentions that the great reformer valued the fables of Aesop next after the Holy Scriptures. In 1546 A.D., the second printed edition of the collection of the fables, made by Platides, was issued from the printing press of Robert Stevens, in which were inserted some additional fables from a manuscript in the Bibliothèque du Roy at Paris. The greatest advance, however, toward a reintroduction of the fables of Aesop to a place in the literature of the world, was made in the early part of the seventeenth century. In the year 1610, a learned Swiss, Isaac Nicholas Neville, sent forth the third printed edition of these fables in a work entitled Mythologia Aesopica. This was a noble effort to do honor to the great fabulist, and was the most perfect collection of Aesopian fables ever yet published. It consisted, in addition to the collections of fables given by Planudes, and reprinted in the various earlier editions, 
of 136 new fables, never before published, from manuscripts in the Library of the Vatican, of 40 fables attributed to Aphthonius, and of 43 from Babrius. It also contained the Latin versions of the same fables by Phaedrus, Avinius, and other authors. This volume of Neverlay forms a complete Corpus Fabularum Aesopicarum, and to his labors, Aesop owes his restoration to universal favor as one of the wise moralists and great teachers of mankind. During the interval of three centuries which has elapsed since the publication of this volume of Nevelais, no book, with the exception of the Holy Scriptures, has had a wider circulation than Aesop's fables. They have been translated into the greater number of the languages both of Europe and of the East, and have been read, and will be read, for generations alike by Jew, heathen, Mohammedan, and Christian. They are, at the present time, not only engrafted into the literature of the civilized world, but are familiar as household words in the common intercourse and daily conversation of the inhabitants of all countries. This collection of Nevelais is the great culminating point in the history of the revival of the fame and reputation of Aesopian fables. It is remarkable, also, as containing in its preface, the germ of an idea which has been since proved to have been correct by a strange chain of circumstances. Neville intimates an opinion that a writer named Babrius would be found to be the veritable author of the existing form of Aesopian fables. This intimation has since given rise to a series of inquiries, the knowledge of which is necessary, in the present day, to a full understanding of the true position of Aesop in connection with the writings that bear his name. The history of Babrius is so strange and interesting that it might not unfitly be enumerated among the curiosities of literature. He is generally supposed to have been a Greek of Asia Minor, of one of the Ionic colonies, but the exact period in which he lived and wrote is yet unsettled. He is placed by one critic as far back as the institution of the Achaean League, B.C. 250, by another as late as the Emperor Severus, who died A.D. 235, while others make him a contemporary with Phaedrus in the time of Augustus. At whatever time he wrote his version of Aesop, by some strange accident, it seems to have entirely disappeared and to have been lost sight of. His name is mentioned by Avianus, by Suidas, a celebrated critic at the close of the 11th century, who gives in his lexicon several isolated verses of his version of the fables, and by John Setzis, a grammarian and poet of Constantinople, who lived during the latter half of the 12th century. Navale, in the preface to the volume which we have described, points out that the fables of Planudes could not be the work of Aesop, as they contain a reference in two places to, quote, holy monks, end quote, and give a verse from the epistle of St. James as an epimith to one of the fables, and suggests Babrius as their author. Francis Vavasor, a learned French Jesuit, entered at greater length on this subject, and produced further proofs from internal evidence from the use of the word Piraeus in describing the harbor of Athens, a name which was not given till two hundred years after Aesop and from the introduction of other modern words, that many of these fables must have been at least committed to writing posterior to the time of Aesop, and more boldly suggests Babrius as their author or collector. These various references to Babrius induced Dr. Pritchard Bentley, at the close of the 17th century, to examine more minutely the existing versions of Aesop's fables, and he maintained that many of them could, with a slight change of words, 
be resolved into the Sasonic Iambics, in which Babrius is known to have written. And with a greater freedom than the evidence then justified, he put forth, in behalf of Babrius, a claim to the exclusive authorship of these fables. Such a seemingly extravagant theory, thus roundly asserted, excited much opposition. Dr. Bentley met with an able antagonist in a member of the University of Oxford, the Honorable Mr. Charles Boyle, afterwards Earl of Orary. Their letters and disputations on the subject, enlivened on both sides with much wit and learning, will ever bear a conspicuous place in the literary history of the seventeenth century. The arguments of Dr. Bentley were yet further defended a few years later by Mr. Thomas Kirwit, a well-read scholar, who gave up high civil distinctions that he might devote himself, the more unreservedly, to literary pursuits. Mr. Tierwit published, A.D. 1776, a dissertation on Babrius and a collection of his fables in Colliambic meter found in a manuscript in the Bodleian Library at Oxford. Francesco de Furia, a learned Italian, contributed further testimony to the correctness of the supposition that Babrius had made a veritable collection of fables by printing from a manuscript contained in the Vatican Library several fables never before published. In the year 1844, however, new and unexpected light was thrown upon this subject. A veritable copy of Babrius was found in a manner as singular as were the manuscripts of Quintilian's Institutes and of Cicero's orations by Paggio in the monastery of St. Gall, A.D. 1416, M. Neonides, at the suggestion of M. Villemain, Minister of Public Instruction to King Louis Philippe, has been entrusted with a commission to search for ancient manuscripts, and in carrying out his instructions, he found a manuscript at the convent of St. Laura on Mount Athos, which proved to be a copy of the long-suspected and wished-for Colliambic version of Babrius. This manuscript was found to be divided into two books, the one containing a hundred and twenty-five, and the other ninety-five fables. This discovery attracted very general attention, not only as confirming, in a singular manner, the conjectures so boldly made by a long chain of critics, but as bringing to light valuable literary treasures tending to establish the reputation and to confirm the antiquity and authenticity of the great mass of Aesopian fable. The fables thus recovered were soon published. They found a most worthy editor in the late distinguished Sir George Cornwall Lewis, and a translator equally qualified in his task in the Reverend James Davies, M.A., sometime a scholar of Lincoln College, Oxford, and himself a relation of their English editor. Thus, after an eclipse of many centuries, Babrius shines out as the earliest and most reliable collector of veritable Aesopian fables. Life of Aesop The life and history of Aesop is involved, like that of Homer, the most famous of Greek poets, in much obscurity. Sardis, the capital of Lydia, Samos, a Greek island, Mesembria, an ancient colony in Thrace, and Cotium, the chief city of the province of Phrygia, contend for the distinction of being the birthplace of Aesop. Although the honor thus claimed cannot be definitely assigned to any one of these places, yet there are few incidents now generally accepted by scholars as established facts relating to the birth, life, and death of Aesop. He is, by an almost universal consent, allowed to have been born about the year 1620 B.C., and to have been, by birth, a slave. 
he was owned by two masters in succession, both inhabitants of Samos, Xanthus and Jadmon, the latter of whom gave him his liberty as a reward for his learning and wit. One of the privileges of a freed man in the ancient republics of Greece was the permission to take an active interest in public affairs, and Aesop, like the philosophers Phaedo, Menippus, and Epictetus, in later times, raised himself from the indignity of a servile condition to a position of high renown. In his desire alike to instruct and to be instructed, he traveled through many countries, and among others came to Sardis, the capital of the famous king of Lydia, the great patron in that day of learning and of learned men. He met at the course of Croesus with Solon, Thales, and other sages, and is related so to have pleased his royal master by the part he took in the conversations held with these philosophers, that he applied to him an expression which has since passed into proverb, the Phrygian has spoken better than all. On the invitation of Croesus, he fixed his residence at Sardis, and was employed by that monarch in various difficult and delicate affairs of state. In his discharge of these commissions, he visited the different petty republics of Greece. At one time he is found in Corinth, and at another in Athens, endeavoring, by the narration of some of his wise fables, to reconcile the inhabitants of those cities to the administration of their respective rulers, Periander and Pisistratus. One of these ambassadorial missions, undertaken at the command of Croesus, was the occasion of his death. Having been sent to Delphi with a large sum of gold for distribution among the citizens, he was so provoked at their covetousness that he refused to divide the money and sent it back to his master. The Delphians, enraged at this treatment, accused him of impiety, and, in spite of his sacred character as ambassador, executed him as a public criminal. This cruel death of Aesop was not unavenged. The citizens of Delphi were visited with a series of calamities until they made a public reparation of their crime, and, quote, the blood of Aesop, end quote, became a well-known adage, bearing witness to the truth that deeds of wrong would not pass unpunished. Neither did the Greek fabulist lack posthumous honors, for a statue was erected to his memory at Athens, the work of Lysippus, one of the most famous of Greek sculptures. Phaedrus thus immortalizes the event, Isapo in gentum statuum posuere atigi servumque colocarunt eterna in basi, petere honoris sirent uncuncti viam, nec genere tribuae sed virtuti gloria. These few facts are all that can be relied on with any degree of certainty in reference to the birth, life, and death of Aesop. They were first brought to light, after a patient search and diligent perusal of ancient authors, by a Frenchman, M. Claude Gaspard Bachet de Miseriac, who declined the honor of being tutor to Louis the Thirteenth of France, from his desire to devote himself exclusively to literature. He published his Life of Aesop, Anno Domini 1632. The later investigations of a host of English and German scholars have added very little to the facts given by M. Mazeriac. The substantial truth of his statements has been confirmed by later criticism and, and inquiry. It remains to state that prior to this publication of M. Mazeriac, the life of Aesop was from the pen of Maximus Planudes, a monk of Constantinople, who was sent on an embassy to Venice by the Byzantine Emperor Andronicus the Elder, and who wrote in the early part of the 14th century. His life was prefixed to all the early editions of these fables, and was republished as late as 1727 
by Archdeacon Croxall as the introduction to his edition of Aesop. This life by Planides contains, however, so small an amount of truth, and is so full of absurd pictures of the grotesque deformity of Aesop, of wondrous and apocryphal stories, of lying legends and gross anachronisms, that it is now universally condemned as false, puerile, and unauthentic. It is given up in the present day by general consent as unworthy of the slightest credit. George Filer Townsend End of Section Zero